Today on the School of Podcasting, we're going to look at what can podcasters learn from the movie industry. The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting Sense 2005. I am your award-winning Hall of Fame podcast coach, Dave Jackson, thanking you so much for tuning in. If you're new to the show, this is where I help you plan, launch, and grow your podcast. My website is schoolofpodcasting.com. Use the coupon code LISTENER, that's L-I-S-T-E-N-E-R, when you sign up for either a monthly or yearly subscription. And today, I always like to start off with either a because of my podcast story, and if you're new to the show, that is simply, if you can answer the question, hey, this wouldn't have happened, but I had a podcast, and holy cow, wait till you hear what happened. You can go out to schoolofpodcasting.com and record one of those or upload one of those, whatever you would like to do. And today is kind of a because of my podcast story, but I also, we're going to start this off. This is the one and only Podfather. That's right. Adam Curry, one of the guys that actually invented podcasting back in the day. And uh, so you're going to hear him and he's talking about a show he does called No Agenda Show. You can find that at noagendashow.com. But on this show, he's talking with the Pod Sage, which is the one and only Dave Jones. And so what Adam is doing is saying he's he's built this podcast index because he's worried that we're all going to get deplatformed in a nutshell and that nobody should be able to control podcasting. So the first thing, if you have not heard me say this before, when people are talking about monetizing their podcast, and that's really one of the things we're going to be talking about today, not so much monetizing, but setting expectations. And so I have said in my book, Profit From Your Podcast, available at ProfitFromYourPodcast.com, that the people I spoke with, most of them had an engagement rate of about 3%. I've mentioned before that there is a really popular show called Radio Lab, and one time I heard them doing kind of a, almost like a PBS pledge drive they were trying to get up to 1%. And here's the podfather talking about no agenda. Just so we put it all into perspective, value for value that I've been doing for a decade and a half, and we're good. We're really good at it. For maybe sometimes, now I'd say 4% of the entire audience donates. That's it. The mm-hmm. rest just need to be shamed and called douchebags. Now, what happens is, over time, People will say, you know, I've been listening for five years. I haven't given anything. And they come in with a whopper amount. Eventually, it it all kind of works out somehow. Well, that should be in the spec. If (laughs) if nobody, if somebody's listening and uh, never donates, it just pops up and says you're a douche. This is what, uh, with no agenda, that's what the listeners slash producers, they develop that themselves. They start calling people out. Hey, that guy, you know, he hit me in the mouth. He told me about the show, but he hasn't donated. He's a douchebag. And then people started donating, saying, oh, I was a douchebag. That's no good. And, and so this, this terminology didn't come from us. I, I don't call people douchebags. Well, I do now. It's Now it's embedded in my brain. Now, he did mention there, and what he means by value for value, this is where instead of having advertising, instead of if you don't have a product or service to sell, you deliver value. That is the key here. It is value for value, not value because you put a bunch of time into it. It's value because you delivered value. And the No Agenda Show delivers insights into the media that I can't get anyplace else. And in the case of the podcast index, I want to see this thing make it. They're actually adding new features to RSS, which eventually will have to knock on the doors of all the media hosts and say, hey, how about adding this to your interface uh, if you want to learn more about this, you can go over to newpodcastapps.com because you can actually boost me right now if you are listening on a new podcast app. This is your friendly boost reminder. It's time to boost. 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 Adam talked about how, you know, some people listen for a long time and then all of a sudden they'll come back. Well, listen to what happened here. We want to thank some people? Yes. Right off the bat, we need to thank uh, an incredible patron of many value for value projects who sent oh. us in his traditional manner in all cash which means uh, it, it's always very freaky to see this show up it showed up in my p.o box 
I'm talking about uh, the patron saint, Sister Onimus of Dogpatch and Lower Slobovia. Oh, we got some Sir Onimus love on this show? $4,000 in cash. In cash? Holy Caller, crap. Shot caller, 20 inch blades on the Impala. He says no. Oh, he says no, no. no. But now he always sends cash when he sends uh, donations uh, because he's completely anonymous. We know a little bit about him, but not really. And uh, and it just showed up in the envelope, and it says for podcast index. That's and so, all it said. And so I, I I have his email, and I say, okay, yeah, you know, oh, man, I'm blown away by this. And you, know, do you have anything to say, or can we credit you? We said, no, you can credit in usual, but I, you know, it's just it's for the index. He's, this is important. He said, this is important what you're doing. So, wow. yeah. Holy cow. It would have been even more impressive if he sent it as a boost, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never escape criticism. So we'll, <laughs> so we'll give him a big... Uh, Podcasting! This is really appreciated. This this goes right into the emergency fund. This, uh, this goes into oh, yeah. our staff. We're very... I mean, I could not be more over the moon about this. Thank you so much. Astronomous of dog patch in Lower Slobovia. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit speechless, to be honest with you. Yeah. $4,000 from one person, and he doesn't even really know their true name. And one of the things that I learned from Adam once when I was talking to him, he said, never put a limit on what your audience can give you. And I see this. I work for Libsyn. That's short for Liberated Syndication. And one of the companies that Libsyn owns is Glow.fm. And I've seen people say, hey, I'm on the whatever level for the you know Jim and Jane show or whatever it is, and I want to change my pledge. And you can do that. It's not quite as easy as I wish it was, but you can do that. And hence, never put a limit on that. So... When we come back, from, I'm going to take a quick little break here because I want to get into this subject, and I don't want to have to stop for for my uh, housekeeping here. But when we come back, I'm going to talk about movies and podcasting and what they have in common and what they don't. All right, I want to talk about movies versus podcasting. And I do want to mention something that I have a big reveal at the end of this episode. So hang tight. But the one thing I noticed when I did some research, and I did a lot of research on this, and if you're wondering why, Dave, did you look into the movie industry? Because the movie industry, authors, musicians, we are all in the entertainment business. And you might think, well, some of us are in the education business. Okay, but you still have to do that in a way that doesn't put people to sleep. So I wanted to see, look, the the movie industry gets billions of dollars every year. What are they doing, and is there anything we can pick up from that? So we're going to point out kind of some pros and cons here. First of all, main, and we're talking about mainstream movies. I'm not talking about your cousin Richard who has that cool old VC. No, this is mainstream movies that you see in a movie theater. And they require a team, and they do not move forward until the idea is approved. And you'll hear people talk about, yeah, I got to get this green light or green lit. And that basically where you go in and you talk to some sort of, you know, movie executive and you're like, I have this idea for a movie where so-and-so and and -and so-and-so do this, but you're not going to believe it. This happens. And and then they have to say yes. Now, they go through extensive writing and rewriting and testing with millions of dollars spent in that development phase. But one of the things I looked into... And as I record this in July of 2022, Spotify is testing in the Netherlands the ability to record directly into Spotify. And so if you think about that, that will not require an RSS feed. Now, I'm going to get slightly geeky here, but hang with me. The RSS feed, I like to use the analogy of radio, and that is, for those of us that remember radio, Your RSS feed was like your signal, your 97.5. And then if you had one of those, you could tune into that station on any single radio you wanted. An old, you know, radio in your car, a boom box, a handheld radio. So that's the beauty of podcasting is it's open. I have an RSS feed 
and I can syndicate anywhere. It doesn't matter. Well, I looked at the top 10 movies in 2022 so far, and there are only five distributors. Uh, Paramount is leading. uh, They have the number one with Top Gun Maverick. They also have Sonic the Hedgehog. Walt Disney has Doctor Strange in the multiverse. They have Thor and Lightyear. Uh, Wait a minute. Yeah, that's Walt Disney is the second one here. So Paramount had two. Walt Disney has three. Warner Brothers has Batman. Are we noticing a theme here? Right? I I haven't seen a rom-com in here yet. Universal, Jurassic, World uh, Dominion, and Minions. So there's a kid's movie. And then the fifth one is Sony Pictures. They have Spider-Man, shocking, another superhero, and Uncharted. And what's funny about that is I don't even know what Uncharted is about. The bottom line is, though, if you want your movie in theaters, you're probably going to have to play nice with these larger distributors. Now, Louis C.K. is a comedian who kind of had a a bad (laughs) couple years there for a while because he did some things he shouldn't have, but he has a new movie out. Now, Louis has made millions of dollars in acting and his TV shows and things like that. He has a movie out called Fourth of July, and because Louis has the money, he did everything himself. So that money that you're looking for the distributor to put up and the movie executives, well, Louis doing that all himself. He's also a writer. Now, where I can see Top Gun Maverick, which I already have, in a boatload of theaters here in Ohio, where I live, if I want to see that Louis movie, it's in one of two theaters. And that's with a guy that has millions of dollars to spend. So there are only so many distributors. And also, you know, Louis, maybe you should ask people if you can uh, scratch a very particular itch in front of people next time. Podcasters, though, they don't have to worry about distributors. And you might say, yeah, but what about Wondery and iHeart and, you know, all these other ones? Well, here's the thing. You have global access out of the gate. When you start a podcast, you have global access. And I always tell you the story. I'll say it briefly here. My very first piece of voicemail came from Michael Van Lahr from Nuremberg, Germany. And it really kind of left me speechless. Now, for many indie podcasters, there is no program director who has to green light your project. It's you and you go, I think I should do this. And you know what? You press record and you go. It's really, you don't have to get it approved. Now, the question is, should you? Hmm, We'll talk about that as we go along. Now, the goal, what is the goal of the podcast? Well, production companies have one goal. They, they ask, who is this for? What do those people want? And more importantly, is this going to make us any money? And one of the things I thought was interesting is when they came out with the first Iron Man movie, this was kind of the first movie from Marvel, and they really tried to stick to the, I was going to say comic book, shame on me, the graphic novel they really stuck as much as they could to the graphic novel because the graphic novel (laughs) nerds really love those things. And the fact that that showed respect to the graphic novel, and it also made the movie great. And so who is this for and what do they want? They want a movie that accurately represents what's going on in the graphic novel. Now, one thing you want to think about You know, many podcasters, well, they might like to make money with their podcast. Keep in mind, there are many doing it simply to help others to get the word out. Maybe they just want to have fun. Or in some cases, I have a podcast. I use it because, well, it's cheaper than therapy. So there are many reasons to make a podcast. I've said it before. You do not, you do not have to make money with your podcast. I know I wrote a book about it, but I'm here to tell you, you don't. Uh, Now, some people jump into the deep end while other people ponder. Maybe I should make a podcast. I probably should. Yeah, mm, but you get a little nervous. I get that. And they ponder the idea of starting a podcast for years. But here's something I wanted to point out about growing your audience. And we're going to talk about this a little later, too. This is a clip from Matt Damon from the YouTube show Hot Ones. I did this movie, Behind the Candelabra. 
when I talked to a studio executive who explained it was a $25 million movie. I would have to put that much into print and advertising, right, to, to market it. Um, what we call PNA, so I'd have to put that in PNA. So now I'm in fifty million dollars. I have to split everything I get with the exhibitor, right? The people who own the movie theaters. So I would have to make a hundred million dollars before I got into profit. And and the idea of making a hundred million dollars on a story about like this love affair between these two people. Yeah, I love everyone in the movie, but I, it's a, that's a, that's suddenly a massive gamble in a way that it wasn't. In the 1990s, when they were making all those kind of movies, the kind of movies that I loved, and and the kind of movies that were my bread and butter. And you should watch the Hot Ones YouTube show. I believe it's now on Hulu, if I remember right. This guy is an amazing interviewer. So think about that. A huge amount of the budget is for marketing. So keep that in mind. You have to allocate, in this case, resources to market your movie. We're going to talk about that as we go along. But really, when it comes to a movie, it starts with the script. And what you may not know, as I did my research on this, is when a writer is trying to sell a script, they rarely, if ever, sell the first version. Screenwriters, they just don't, that's like a a unicorn. It's just the hard truth. And we, I know you worked hard on your your script, Mr. Writer, but, eh, you know. And it said it might take a handful of screenplays before a writer gets one green light. It can happen, right? But it's the exception. It's not the norm. And why is that? Well, your first script is where you make your mistakes. They say even your second and third scripts are for ironing out the kinks. The fourth script is where you really understand the structure and craft while your fifth script is where you start finding your voice. And this is where I say, please don't record your first episode and then release it. You need to do some woodshedding. That's an old musician term, which means practice in the basement. Now, it may be, again, that that first recording was just magic, okay, but that's not the norm. And plus, by recording these and recording these, you're going to get more confident. And I'm kind of with this particular writer. I'll have links to everything in the description where I got this information. But, uh, you know, record a couple and throw them away, especially if you're doing interviews. That's why I say record your parents, record your kids, record your cat, whoever you're interviewing. Don't make your first real interview be your first real interview. And they say uh, get your craft to the point that it's so good that people can't deny it. They say make people have faith in your work even if you're not yet getting any green lights. They say being a working, admired screenwriter without a green lit project is absolutely perfectly normal. Again, you're going to have to be a little patience. Now this is the part where I think movies and podcasters kind of part a little bit. And if you're a regular listener of the show and you're thinking, oh, I know what Dave is going to say, and I would say, yeah, you're right. Uh, Exposing your ideas, they say, to potential audience is is what makes the difference between an okay idea and a great one. I've talked about it in the past. Ron Howard, who has eight bazillion Emmys, Grammys, he doesn't get Grammys, he doesn't sing, but Oscars, all that stuff, he still has every one of his movies go in front of an audience before he releases it to the public. And they say what happens sometimes is while you lock yourself in your room, that can really support the creative process. I know that as a musician. There are times when I'll be in a room with a a keyboard and a guitar and a recorder, and the, the creative process is just going crazy. But they say it's important not to isolate yourself from others because isolation can hinder the process of being successful. They send, send the idea to your friends, your family, and your managers. They say anyone who can brutally and systematically dismantle just about every single one of those items, whatever you just did. And I laugh now because when I was a teenager in my early 20s, I had a a little recording studio in my basement. And I listen, when I listen back to that, I cringe and I'm just like, Oh my God, nobody, nobody ever said this is awful. 
and you're singing way out of your key. So when I say your friends and family won't tell you, yeah, that's not good, uh, it's because it, it. I never got that. They say, even if you stubbornly refuse to back down or secretly believe that people, hey, they just don't get your genius, man. I'm in my zone of genius, dude. They say more often than not, the people that are giving you constructive feedback are correct in some way. They've tapped into something, even if you might not agree with everything you're saying. George Harbinger once said that when people ask for feedback, what they're really looking for you to do is just agree with everything that they've done so far. And I'm starting to see that a little bit. This is where I, I say it over. You need to find somebody who will tell you the truth. And obviously, I know you're thinking, oh, you're just saying that because I offer that as a service. It, yeah, I do. But really, in some cases, I'm not your target audience. You need somebody who is your target audience. If your show is for busy moms, mm, I'm not really, yeah. So keep that in mind. So think about this. What does a movie do? They rewrite the script. They rewrite the script. They they swap out actors in some cases. They do all sorts of stuff. And then they get feedback on that. And the YouTube video I was watching on some of these, they explain that in some cases what people are actually seeing is kind of a rough draft of the movie. I remember I appear in the documentary called The Messengers, a, a podcast uh, documentary. And through, un unfortunately, one of the editor's father was having serious health issues and all sorts of stuff. And so instead of having the documentary finished for PodFest, it was this kind of rough draft, but it was kind of cool because we got to get feedback on what they had done so far. So in this case, movies often will show something that's not, I mean, it's done, but it's not completely done. They're just trying to figure out, are they on the right path? And so I went to Kickstarter because what happens with a movie is movies get, I mean, they sharpen that content as good as they can get it. And then they come up with the best promos and all that other stuff. They're ready to go out and tell people about their show. And we heard where Matt Damon said a big chunk of that is spending money on marketing. But what I saw is I went out to Kickstarter. You know, this is where people try to raise money for funds. Often it's like, hey, I'm in the hospital. It cost $8 bazillion to have an ambulance. Can somebody help me out? And here again, remember crowdfunding, the first word is crowd. The second one is funding. It's not fund crowding. You got to have a crowd for this to often work or at least an engaged audience. And so when I looked into this, at the bottom of these, hey, I need some money, they kind of list why they need the money. And I'm, I'm going to keep everybody's names out of this. I am, I, I'm going to sound very judgmental because, um, I'm being very judgmental in this case, but I'm, I'm just here to say, and, and we'll talk about a, a classic movie flop that used this kind of strategy and it doesn't work. So one person said this about why you should give them money. Growing an audience will be a struggle as we have no experience and no connections. Hopefully what's going to fix it? the better equipment can lighten this load. So I'm going to switch from one microphone to another one, and somehow that's going to just make my numbers go through the roof. Now, they had a goal of $842, and so far they have a dollar pledged from one backer, and they have 49 days to go. So I wish them luck. Another person said, this is my second attempt at a Kickstarter. Creating a podcast hasn't been easy. And this is where I say... Creating a podcast is easy. Creating a good podcast takes some effort. In this case, this person is trying to make a true crime show. And I can't believe they can't get money for a true crime show because those things are, you know, that's money in the bank, right? But they say, here are the reasons why. Technical issues with a laptop. Uh, didn't have enough money to buy podcast equipment. I need to pay for podcast hosting service. I've tried creating a campaign project but failed and I lost it all. They have $2 out of 150 with two backers with 46 days to go. So this is a person that doesn't have a ton of content. Now, they're trying to do a true crime show. So I'm assuming this is narrative and they're going to have fun music and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, that's an expensive podcast. 
maybe to make because it's very time consuming, which means you're probably going to want a team if you want to keep your sanity. And again, I'm just saying maybe we need to set realistic expectations. There is Girls in Space. That is a show that started off with one person at her kitchen table. And then she grew it and grew it. And, and what was it? Was it the technology? Oh, no, because she was making her own sound effects. It was the story that grew that show. So, again, everybody's like, all I need is the technology and money will fly from heaven. Uh, here's another one. We want to be able to provide better quality and do advertising to reach a bigger audience. They have $21 pledged of their $50,000 goal. They have two backers and 33 days to go. And this is where I sound like a judgmental person. I realized we said at the beginning that only maybe three to 4% are going to contribute. And if your 3% is two people, maybe we don't have that crowd part down yet. And you're looking for $50,000. So unless the Monopoly guy, you know, whatever his name is with the monocle is listening, that could be a problem. Now, they're not all going down the, the toilet. There was one had 19 backers with 27 days to go. They had $948 pledged. The problem was their goal was 10000 And again, they had technologies going to make this thing great. One person had a video explaining that they did a season during COVID where they talked about things they are passionate about. And they fixed up a room. So they made their own little studio now they're asking for $5,602 so they can do what? That's right, upgrade the equipment. With 18 days to go, they have $4 from two backers. And so here's something I want to talk about is there are people in just not podcasting, but the content marketing space. And the answer is just talk about what you're passionate about and money will fall from heaven and you can quit your day job, escape the cubicle, Yada, yada, yada. And look, I am a guy that says you need to talk about something you're passionate about, but there needs to be more than passion. There needs to be, going back to Adam's comment, value. And I can talk about how much I love pineapple coleslaw. I had my first bit of that today. I went to a new restaurant. It was really, really good. And I could do episodes, but I'm going to run out of content and... I don't know that I'm going to be able to make a living talking about pineapple coleslaw. And I want to wrap up this segment with two things. One is the big reveal. And the second one is I'm going to borrow. And if you're a regular listener of the show, I apologize for the the repeat, but I'm going to talk about the Lone Ranger again. This is a story I've heard about from Rob Walsh from Libsyn. And also, if you ever read any kind of story about the top 10 mistakes or flops from uh, Hollywood, this is usually somewhere in the top five. And it is The Lone Ranger, which really comes in handy right now because it stars Johnny Depp. And this was Johnny Depp even more popular than he is now. And right now, uh, as his divorce was just finalized and everybody's talking about him, this is back when people talked about him because he was good, not so much that somebody pooped in a bed. And so this was the height of the Pirates of the Caribbean and things like that. So I was I was thinking about this. How do I explain this to people that weren't around for the Pirates of the Caribbean? It'd be like Tom Cruise putting out a movie and just having it tank. And I'm not saying that Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks, uh, Tom Cruise hasn't had bad movies, but the last couple have been really, really popular. And so it had Johnny Depp at the height of his Johnny Deppness. It had some other guy's name who I can't remember as the actual Lone Ranger. And basically, to make a long story short, they created this movie. There were some kind of uh, discrepancies with, I think, directors and story. They didn't quite get that right. So maybe needed a little more rewrite, whatever. But hey, we don't care. We have Johnny Depp and we've already got the whole uh, McDonald's Happy Meals ready to go. We've got the Lone Ranger gun set, of course. And, uh, you know, all the stuff, all the marketing for the kids, et cetera, et cetera. And the movie just tanked. And I know that because I saw that movie and it was awful. And I remember going, wait, what happened to Johnny Depp? In this case, Walt Disney, I believe, was the uh, distributor. Their 
solution for it was, well, we just need more marketing. And this is one of my main points. And again, if you're a regular listener, you've heard me say this. If your show isn't resonating with people and you're just like, oh, I'm just going to go buy some Buzzsprout ads or I'm going to go to advertise cast and see if I can do that. Or you can advertise on Spotify. You can advertise on Overcast. And that's going to be another episode in the future because I want to play with those. But realize that the distributor, Walt Disney, just kept pouring more and more money into it. They're like, oh, the reason this isn't doing well is because people don't know about it. No, people did know about it. And they were telling their friends, don't go see that movie. The reason I saw Top Gun Maverick, besides the fact that I saw the original one many moons ago over and over and over, is I had people that saw that and said, yeah, if you like Top Gun movies, you should go see it and go see it in a big theater. And that's exactly what I did. Word of mouth. Now, while the Lone Ranger was uh, bursting into flames, losing gazillions of dollars, the Sixth Sense, uh, again, Rob Walsh brings this up. This was a movie with Bruce Willis and some kid that saw dead people. If you've ever heard somebody go, I see dead people. That's that. This movie had almost no budget, and yet it outsold many, many. It's it's up there with one of the best movies ever because especially most profitable because it had a small budget and everybody that left that theater called somebody on the phone and said, you got to go see this movie and I'm coming with you. And I'm trying not to spoil the movie. Uh, If you've seen the movie, you know why. If you haven't seen the movie, go to Amazon or something. It is a great flick. So the bottom line is here, we can learn from Disney. Marketing is not going to save your show And the step I think that most people skip is getting feedback. And I'm going to throw myself under the bus. Now, I do quite a number of shows that I don't say are, quote, real. It's me playing usually with another media host or some technology. And so I launched one called the Podcast Trailer Show, where you guessed it, you hear podcast trailers. And I, A, did I do five episodes? And, and, and get those out of my way. Nope. Did a couple, did a little research, but didn't do five episodes. Cause if I had, I would have realized I have a problem. And that is most podcast trailers are absolutely awful. My favorite, I had one last week where the person did not say their name. They didn't say the name of the show and they didn't say their, their website. They just kind of spouted out keywords about their industry. It was very interesting. And so my name is on that show and I'm promoting these things. So I finally just had to update it and say, Hey, I'm picking these trailers, not because they're good because the show is good, but because the trailer was easy to find. And I am kind of already thinking I'm going to do maybe a hundred episodes of the show and then tap out. But I didn't get any feedback on this because when I finally listened to my own show with a set of kind of fresh ears, I was like, Oh, this is horrible. Like I knew it wasn't going to be great. The idea of it was how can I make a show with very little time involved with it? And that's one of those where you're like, well, sometimes you you get what you put into it. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean if I'd put 5,000 hours into that first episode, it would have been good. No, the problem was the way I had it out on paper, 30% of my episodes were advertising. And I don't know about you, I'm not waking up late on Saturday because I can't wait to see the ShamWow infomercial. It's just not what I'm going to do. And so I didn't get any feedback from anybody. And for the record, part of that was because I was like, ah, this isn't a real show. This is me playing. But I should have got some feedback anyway. Because when I finally heard it with fresh ears, I was like, oh, this is horrible. Like, this isn't just bad. This is This is a waste of time. And that's the thing with movies, if you think about it. Yes, movies are expensive. If you go to the movies, it's you know four hundred dollars for a bucket of popcorn. But more valuable than that, uh, the movies these days they're long, and so you're asking people to give up their time, and so are podcasts. And we need to make sure that we're not wasting their time. So maybe get some feedback before we start spending our marketing budget because. In the end, what happens to movies that don't make any money is you end up with a brand, maybe, that isn't 
Great. Now, let me give you an example of this. Right. When I see Warner Brothers come up, I'm like, okay, this should be a good movie. This is a major distributor. And in the past, and it still happens, Blog Talk Radio is a media host. They're still around. And the idea of Blog Talk Radio was, again, ease, ease of use. Again, making a podcast, not hard. Making a good podcast, hmm, takes a little work. And I remember, and it wasn't just me, there were other kind of podcast snobs that when I heard this phrase, Blog Talk Radio, I knew I was going to hit stop. Because what was coming next was going to sound so bad, I didn't want to listen to it. So the person that says, hey, I need really good audio quality, I'm going to tell you in a second what I'm using for this. And you're going to go, really? Yeah. So it's Blog Talk Radio had bad audio quality to the point that when I heard that Blog Talk Radio, I almost instantly hit stop because I knew what was coming. Now, and this is where people go, oh my God, Dave's going to talk about Anchor. I am not a fan of Anchor at all, but I am to the point now that if I find a new podcast and it starts off with, hey, when I started a podcast, Anchor, blah, 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 earn money, yada, yada, I'm like, Pfft. because I'm fine. I had a, a a trailer come through that was just beyond bad. Now, again, that makes me sound judgmental because I'm being uh, judgmental. And by that, I mean that trailer did not make me want to listen to their show, which I believe is the goal of the trailer. But when I looked at this, basically what sounded like a bunch of kids playing, which is fine, they're having fun. Remember, you can get paid in fun. I was, I looked, I was like, of course, they're on anchor. So I'm, I'm finding more and more that the shows, again, just for fun, having a good time, it's three bros in the basement, cracking some cold ones, go to town. Just don't turn around, though, like a movie executive and go, how can I make money with this thing? Those are some things we can learn from movies and apply it to our podcast. And remember, again, that the goal of a movie is to entertain you for a few hours to the point that you go out and tell a friend and that they tell two friends and they tell two friends because that's what they do. They spend money on marketing to get you in the theater and then they rely on word of mouth. And now for the big reveal, I'm not using my Shure SM7B, that $400 microphone. I am not using... My Samson Q2U, that $70 microphone that I recommend all the time. I am using a company I barely know. It's Power DeWise. It is a lavalier microphone that I spent $35 on. What, what, what? Now, why, Dave, are you doing this today? Because I wanted to show you it's not the technology. Yes, we got a little popping peas. We got some, some noise from my shirt. But people tune in for the content, not the technology. I, I was making radio shows for fun. All right. Next, you're going to hear the raw audio from that lavalier mic. Then you're going to hear the raw audio through what I call Shep's Omni Channel. And the reason I call it that is because it's called, you guessed it, Shep's Omni Channel. And then you're going to hear me on the Sure SM7B. And then you're going to hear me while well, you're hearing it now. The Shure SM7B through Shep's Omni Channel. Isn't, it's almost as fun as listening to Hiss, which is what we did last week. Now, why, Dave, are you doing this today? 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 And the answer is to prove that it's not the technology because none of those audio quality examples, right? I was using this $35 cheap lavalier, and yet you're still here. It didn't make you tune out. <laughs> so one other point I want to make here is we started off talking about how movie distributors, there's only so many that are big that are really going to get you the exposure that you want, which means you have to play ball with them. And one of the big distributors 
is Netflix. And I watched this one video and this guy was explaining what it's like to work with Netflix. So I pitched it and they said, okay, sounds good. We like it. Let's do it. But we don't want to take delivery from you because you're an indie producer. We want to take delivery from a distribution company that we're already set up to do business with because we don't want to set you up as a new client in our database. It's too much work for us. So I said, but I'm also a distributor. I have my own distribution company and um, I, I make delivery. I'm like, I, I make perfect delivery to the distributors or to, I, I'm making delivery to broadcasters around the world. So delivery is not an issue. And they said, yeah, but we're so busy. We have so much going on. We would prefer that we put you through a distributor. And I said, I don't have a problem with that except for they're going to charge me a full fee for doing nothing. I mean, I pitched you, I did the sale, you want the movie, I'm going to have to pay their full commission. And they said, Jeff, you seem like a sharp guy, figure it out. Go negotiate it, figure it out. So they gave me a list of, of like six or seven distributors that they recommended who I could do business with. I met with two of them, I chose one of them, and I c- cut a good deal, but not a fantastic deal because I had no leverage. They knew that I was sent there. So... I had to deliver through another distributor. I was kind of a little peeved by it, but you know what? It was Netflix. That's what they wanted. And what am I going to argue? I mean, you know, so that I had, I had to do that deal. And I realized that this is kind of the curmudgeoned uh, national anthem. But if we allow podcasting to kind of push RSS to the side and not replace it with something that's open to where we have to rely on someone to get us into these directories. Now I realize you might say, but Dave, you have to get approved now. Yes, but there are people who have been deplatformed that can still use an RSS feed and you can still get their content. You can kick me out of Spotify. You can kick me out of Apple. You can kick me out of anywhere. As long as I have an RSS feed, then I still have an audience. Please don't make me say I told you so in five years. I really don't want to do that. I do have a background where I worked in the music business and those people, again, not exactly known for their generosity and fair play. So keep that in mind. I did do most of the show today with a $35 lavalier mic. I don't recommend doing that unless you feel really comfortable with a $35 lavalier mic. I was amazed at how my delivery and things like that, a lot of editing going on behind here because I just wasn't quite as comfortable because I really hated the way I sounded. And one thing, though, about this, there are so many people that want to use a free media host and not put out any money and things like that. One of the videos about how do you get a movie made had this great point. Because, like I said on the show before, no one's going to invest in you if you aren't willing to first invest in yourself. Of course, that doesn't necessarily have to mean money. That can also just mean time. Often, it does just mean time and effort. You can't do great things with little to no resources. So when you first start off and you don't have money for maybe the extra gear that you want to get, then take the resource you have, which is time, and invest in how to tell a story. Invest in how to work a microphone without it having a bunch of popping peas and use the time you have to go listen to what your audience wants so that you can give it to them. Then when the final product comes out, your audience will just have to tell their friends about it because it's that good. Also want to throw in one thing in case you're new to the show. When I say, Hey, the reason I'm being judgmental is because I'm being judgmental. That is me somewhat being sarcastic. Hopefully you picked up on that. And, um, If you don't think people judge you, yeah, the person in Walmart last night when you were in there, yeah, they were looking at your cart. You get judged every day. Everything I mentioned today, you can find at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 835. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. Again, schoolofpodcasting.com slash 835. If you know somebody who is starting a podcast and you want to help them set realistic expectations, do consider sending them this episode, especially if they're thinking about crowdfunding. I think when people hear that 4%, they're like, wait, what? Yeah, I know it sucks. The website, schoolofpodcasting.com. Use the coupon code listener when you sign up to save on either a monthly or yearly subscription. Until next week, 
Take care. God bless. Class is dismissed. You know, little Opie Cunningham, Richie Cunningham, whatever. The, the guy's a, a film, you know, he's just, he's Mr. Film Guy. Yeah, that's it. I think it's on his business card.